The bright side of addiction is recovery. In this edition of Recovery Coast to Coast, we will explore grief and recovery. Grief is love with no place to go. We're going to meet Lily Doolin, a psychotherapist from Southern California who wrote the book Giving Grief Meaning. Lily's young daughter passed away from sudden infant death syndrome when Lily was newly sober. She called it a beautiful gift. And we'll be joined in the conversation by Tom McGovern, an integral part of the Center for Collegiate Recovery Communities at Texas Tech University in Lubbock. Tom is a leader and a legend in the field of addiction studies, and he will join us from down in Texas. And award-winning actress Julie Harris will add some inspirational thoughts on the power of prayer. I'm Neil Scott, host of Recovery Coast to Coast. Our website is recoverycoasttocoast.org. That's recoverycoasttocoast, one word, dot org. Following 15 years of nightly broadcasting on iHeartRadio in Seattle, we have now upgraded to a national podcast available to anyone at any time and featuring interviews with recovering celebrities, clinicians, authors, everyday people in long-term recovery, plus well-vetted resources for individuals, families, and friends. We invite you to enjoy the podcast and to share it with your friends as well. Recovery is an American way of life. And by the way, we would love to hear from you. Drop us a line at recoverycoasttocoast at comcast.net. Let us know your thoughts about the podcast. Perhaps you have a subject or maybe a guest that you would like to suggest. Again, that's recoverycoasttocoast at comcast.net. Recovery Coast to Coast is generously supported by the good folks at Sundown M Ranch, one of the oldest and most successful treatment programs and affordable addiction treatment centers in America, having successfully treated well over 200,000 adults, adolescents, families for the past 50-plus years. It's where recovery really begins. And quite frankly, a successful treatment program that has been treating patients over five decades has obvious success or they wouldn't still be around. And success at sundown is measured by many aspects of the treatment process and experience. For example, they conduct many internal reviews and assessments. They also use external organizations to examine their practices. By the way, they are currently participating in a national outcome study to help benchmark with other treatment programs around the country. Can you guarantee they will quote unquote, cure your addiction or your loved one's addiction? Absolutely not. And any treatment program that can tell you that they can cure your addiction, stay away from them. Sundown will certainly give you the necessary tools to live a life free of alcohol and other drugs, and you become part of the Sundown family, which has a robust alumni program for those who have successfully completed inpatient treatment. Recovery is a lifelong process. And you know, oftentimes alcohol and other drugs are not the only problem. Many individuals have co-occurring disorders, including mental health issues. Sundown is professionally able to successfully treat those matters involving dual diagnosis. Check out their website, easy to remember, it's a good website, sundown.org, O-R-G. The road to recovery begins at Sundown M Ranch. Let's meet our two guests on this podcast, Lily Doolin. She's a woman in long-term recovery, a therapist in private practice in Southern California, and the author of Giving Grief Meaning, a method for transforming deep suffering into healing and positive change. And also Dr. Thomas McGovern, Professor Emeritus at Texas Tech down in Lubbock, Texas. <laughs> All right, we have two guests on the program today. One is a leader and legend in the field of alcoholism and addiction studies. The other is a woman who just wrote a stunning, heartfelt book about grief and giving it meaning and about her daughter's death and the blessings that followed. Let's meet our guest. Dr. Tom McGovern is a professor and director emeritus of the Center for Ethics, Humanities, and Spirituality at Texas Tech University Health Science Service Center, School of Medicine down in Lubbock, Texas. And Tom has been involved for, gosh, over 40 years as a counselor, a teacher, a writer, an advocate for persons and families 
experiencing the misuse of alcohol and other drugs. I met Tom at a conference in San Antonio a few years ago, and we became fast friends. We have bonded, and uh, I've grown to love this man. He's been a mentor to many, a friend to all, and a man of distinguished character. He also hosts a radio program on NPR station down in Lubbock, Texas. Tom is a person in long-term recovery. He continues to be an integral part of the Center for Collegiate Recovery Communities at Texas Tech University in Lubbock, Texas. I am pleased to call Tom my friend. Welcome, Tom. Neil, delight to be with you again, and thanks for that lovely uh, introduction. I could almost become a legend in my own mind. <laughs> <laughs> but that, I know it's heartfelt, and thank you so much for that. Lovely affirmation. You're certainly welcome. Lily Doolin is a therapist who created a heart-centered system of healing. She calls it the name work. We'll find out what that's all about. She started a foundation called the Kara Love Project, named after her daughter, Kara, who died of sudden infant death syndrome. Kara was only two months old when she passed away. Lily found a way to see her daughter's untimely death as one of God's greatest blessings. Lily honors her memory to this day and is the author of a compelling book called Giving Grief Meaning, a method for transforming deep suffering into healing and positive change. Lily is also a woman in long-term recovery. and She found the willingness to change as she found the love and the support of a woman's only 12-step group. Lily, welcome to Recovery Coast to Coast. Thank you. It's so nice to be here. Tom, let's start with you and how you came to know Lily. How I came in contact with Lily was through the announcement of her book uh, from her publisher, from the publisher of her book. And um, as the editor of the Alcoholism Treatment Party, I get many um, blurbs on books. And I was intrigued by this book because the original description was of a, a person, a, a mother who was grieving the death of her daughter from SIDS, but at the same time, was working through her grief in the most the most complete way I thought, and incorporating into the narrative of her recovery a really close association of of her life and of a sense of well being with the AA and with twelve step program. So that's how I came in contact with Lily. Lily, take us back to the beginning, if you would, in, in terms of uh, coming to grips with your alcoholism and and the death of your daughter. Like many alcoholics, I nearly missed the opportunity to become a, a mother. I got sober to become a mother and was facing fertility issues. It would have been impossible to go through the rounds of fertility treatment, passed out drunk. So I came to the rooms of Alcoholics Anonymous. Who told you about AA? What was your entrance point into the fellowship? I had an amazing neighbor, mm. and she had me over for dinner one night, and when her partner offered me a glass of wine, and I said I wasn't drinking, she was like, oh, Lily, thank God, and she really stayed on me, and uh, was like, I need to bring you to a meeting, come to the meeting, and I finally just wanted her off of my back, <laughs> and I went along with her, and something in me opened up that day, um, and I had hope, and I I got sober, and I wouldn't have stayed sober on my own. I wouldn't have been able to finish the fertility treatments. I would have been back out there. But the support, the fellowship, the love um, that I found in those rooms um, compelled me to stay um, long enough to really admit that I had a problem. And uh, through uh, staying sober, our beautiful daughter, Kara, came into the world. Um, we brought her home. She was gaining weight. She passed in the night of sudden infant death syndrome, my world was shattered. How long were you and sober at that point? About two years. Mm. I was really newly sober, and it was a very tender time 
but the love, the love of the women in particular in my own group was unbelievable. I, I stuck with it. I decided to stay sober one day at a time was through the love, through the fellowship. Ultimately, after many years, I would come to write the book about eight years later. Lily, on, the, on page 28, in the middle of page 28 of your wonderful book, you write about how AA and how it's so significantly helpful for you. Will you read just a little of that for our, for our list? Now we were gathered for a different reason. We were in mourning. And I had to connect with my community to save myself from thinking. I later consulted Rabbi Neil Thomas Daniel, who, like Reverend Michael, would become an important teacher in my life. Did an angry God take her, I asked him, tears spilling down my face. Am I I being punished? No, he told me. Ours is a loving God. You did nothing wrong. Please don't worry yourself. His assurances offered me no peace. For a long time, I wasn't willing to see the good in our world or in God. A loving God would not have taken my baby. There was no sense or order to my world, but somehow I knew that this attitude would not save me. I would have to let myself off the hook and learn to trust life. I saw grief as an ocean with no way to fathom its depths. The only way to assign meaning to Kara's short life was for me to choose to live again. My 12-step sponsor told me to act as if. That meant act as if the world was good, as if God was love, as if I had the courage to make it through. If I persisted in insisting that it was too late, that mankind was depraved, that an angry God had punished me by taking my baby, I wouldn't be able to function. Lily, this captures so beautifully at the beginning of the book how an integral part of your grieving, of your recovery, of dealing with the death of your beloved daughter was tied in so beautifully and so powerfully with this with this recovery. You talk, you know, in Chapter 3 about, again, how AA helps you to find your way. If you turn to the middle again of page 33, and maybe I'll read from this one for you, <laughs> and then you can comment on your own, on your own, on your own quotation, okay? Wonderful. Thank God during that time, a well-meaning neighbor took me to a 12-step meeting of which I am still a part. I had been to recovery groups before, but never had a sense of belonging like I did there. The women embraced me and valued me until I could value myself. I eventually learned that I could take stock of my life and examine what was allowing me to hold back. In the 12-step program, they called, this process of reading self, uh, this rigorous self-examination, taking a moral, moral inventory. Lee, I think you capture for you know, three of us and for the many of our listeners uh, this evening, the sense of hope and finding your way, not to by, by staying sober, but also to the huge, momentous, moment, monumental struggle you had to, to just to keep going after the death of your daughter. In the rooms of Alcoholics Anonymous or 12-step recovery rooms uh, more generally, you'll find someone who's been through exactly what you've been through. Now, my specific work, which I call the name work, is my way of sharing my experience, strength, and hope. When Kara passed, all I had left was her name, K-A-R-A. Gradually, gradually, out of that broken place, these qualities began to emerge out of her name. They're the qualities of K. The K in Kara is for kindness. A is alignment. R is regeneration. And A is for action. And these qualities gradually began to serve as my North Star for living. And they became a means for me to evaluate my life and evaluate how I'm doing, like take the K in kindness, I had to ask myself, when have I been unkind when I was strong enough? First, I had to put, as they say, the oxygen mask on myself. But then I really had to say, when have I been unkind? How can I clean up my side of the street? Um, And and through that, 
I saw that I could help other people work with their names in a similar way or in a way that feels right for them to move through whatever they need to move through. Moving through this journey is such a central theme and such a central message and such a wonderful encouragement in, in the book. And again, I want to give, you know, the listeners this evening a sense of the wonder of the book as we go. You talk on page 37 how it is important for us in recovery and in living and practicing these principles in all our affairs, the necessity of facing our suffering, we can't run from it. And if you would read for us again. It has been imperative for me to see life as a series of events that led me to where I am today. That doesn't mean I have to like them, that only I can pull myself out of hell. So where are you today that has led you to this book? Have you been on a quest for meaning? Are there some life events that deserve your examination and love? Have you ever had an aha moment long after the fact when not getting what you desperately wanted made sense? Even if the life has treated you terribly up until now, I promise that consciously choosing to acknowledge your pain and heal will sow the seeds for change. That doesn't mean that the pain will abate immediately or that you will be living in a fantasy land where all is perfect. But you will have begun the process, and you might gain a renewed sense of order and reason out of the unreasonable. Let's go back to Neil. Neil, as we share this paragraph together, what would your reflection back to Lily be and continuing this conversation between the three of you? Well, it, you know, it's, it's a matter of the fact that you don't have to like them. You know, it's imperative for me to see a series of events that that led me to where I am today. You don't have to like where you are, but you have to deal with where you are. You have to meet life on life's terms. And and Lily has certainly done that. Like the program of Alcoholics Anonymous, it's a simple program, but not an easy program. It's simple to say these things, but the action takes a lot of work. Right, Lily? I think 12-step programs are the only program that I know of, uh, maybe a little bit in dialectical behavioral therapy, but it emphasizes contrary action, yes. acting as if, doing the opposite. So getting out of bed when I don't feel like me, and then making the bed, brushing my teeth, doing the next best thing, doing the, the right thing, what's in front of me. What is the saying? I can't think my way into right acting but I can act my way into right thinking. That's amazing. And it, it's really about leaning into recovery and and letting the people that you love, the people that you care about, surround you with love and to, to love you when perhaps you're not able to love yourself. She captures it again so powerfully. And if you mind, I might read this a little bit from Lily Rice, that when I embrace the healing journey and see that pain is a part of the healing process, I can begin to create a more holistic vision of life. I want to say here that if I had continued to insist that God was punishing me by taking my baby or that my negative thinking caused it, I would have destroyed myself. Mm. Even in the in the seemingly endless depths of my pain, I had to act as if there was a loving God. And I think this resonates in the steps of the 12 steps, you know. Practice these principles in all our affairs, facing the pain, facing the suffering, in the help of others. Then on the next page, and I don't, I don't want to monopolize your book in any sense or your, your commentary on your own work, but you mentioned the Buddhist philosophy, which many of us would have some connection with, is that we are connected. And that we're connected especially in the compassion, which is born of our suffering, our shared suffering, and certainly grief can be pandemic times and grief and all of many or many experiences of our addictions is something that we can connect with each other. In that same page, you, you remember Ram Das. You might just, at this moment, you would, Billy, really, for a second, reflect on, tell him who he was, first of all. He was very important to me in the early part of my recovery and subsequently, you know, in his own, in the darkness of his own life following a massive stroke. What did you learn from Ram Das in terms of your own journey? Well, I came to Ram Dass after his stroke. Many like to say, actually, there was a film, Fierce Grace, on his life. And that's what he emanated. The fact that he went on 
to continue to teach and be a positive presence for others in a body crippled, really hurting uh, by the stroke. He suffered from aphasia, and his his words were his music. He continued on. He found new uh, successes in life, even if that was just moving from point A to point B. He had this this presence, this way of bringing people to the moment. And his best-selling book was Be Here Now. And that was all about being in the moment. Many would argue that if Ram Dass hadn't walked around, formerly Richard Alpert, professor at Harvard, sweet mate with Timothy Leary, if there had been no Ram Dass, there would be no human potential movement as we know it today. If people want to find out more about Ram Dass, uh, I'm, I might give out a website, which is R-A-M-D-A-S-S, Ramdas dot org, and there's all sorts of things there. On page, on page 118, you have an example of your name work using the name Ram Dass, and you could show how you use how you use, utilize the name work with the letters of Ram Dass. I think this is beautiful. The following is how I utilize the name work with the letters in Ram Dass. R is for reverence. I am filled with reverence for life. I give thanks for the present moment. A is for attention. I am centered and responsible, placing my full attention on the task in front of me. M is for magic. I embrace the magic of healing and affirm that miracles are possible. B is for devoted. I remember to be devoted to feeding people serving people, and remembering God. A is for absolute. My faith is absolute and unwavering. S is for soul. I live in alignment with my dharma or soul's purpose. And S is for surrender. I surrender into the now moment. Lily, that is so beautiful, and the echo is a prayer that you have in the book. The light of God surrounds me. The love of God enfolds me. The power of God protects me. The presence of God watches over me. Wherever I am, God is. I am loved. I am safe. I am protected. I am loved. God is love. I, this is the power and the wonder of this affirming honest, authentic book of yours is that you've incorporated, for those of us who are listening to feeding from our 12-step position, but you've incorporated in your growth process the wonders of many others. Lily, talk about the power and the importance of affirmation and prayer in our daily affairs. I see this sort of connection that we're all, the three of us are having together and with the wider audience as sort of a moving prayer, a living prayer. When we gather together, when we connect authentically, when we explore subjects that are larger than ourselves, when we explore our own names, that in itself becomes a part of the prayer, of meditation. It's taking like attracts like, connecting, conversing, filling ourselves with people on the path, people who are trudging that way, people who affirm together. God grant me the serenity to accept the things I cannot change, the courage to change the things I can, and the wisdom to know the difference. You have a number of affirmations that come out of your name work. Would you share with our listeners as we begin to heal and we perhaps move out of a victim mode, which is a necessary part of grieving, but to a more healing place, would you read some of the affirmations that I think I found very, very, for me personally, and I'm sure... Our listeners, Anil, would, 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 would resonate with these. As I read them, let's come together. If, if you feel comfortable, just place your hand on your heart. Maybe you can feel your heartbeat, your breath, and it's out of this centered space. And just taking three deep breaths, we can take three deep breaths anywhere. And we can affirm, even if we don't feel it, even if we can't see it, we still affirm it. I am enough. I take time each day for myself and change my mind if I need to. I seek out safe environments where I feel protected. I practice self-care by walking away from or ignoring what no longer serves me. I connect with others on the healing journey. I create bonds out of connection and common ground. I listen to my body and breath. 
I am on a beautiful journey and I'm learning to trust my instincts. I am kind to myself by taking care of myself. I breathe in goodness and I breathe out what no longer serves me. I can sense your breath in that statement, Billy, so beautifully as breathing in the light, the goodness, and then breathing out the struggle, you know, this that which is negative and which inhibits our connection with ourselves and with others. By the way, we talked about this too, Lily, that Tara or Kara in, in Gaelic means, I'm Irish, of course, you, you would never have guessed that, but Kara <laughs> <laughs> uh, in Gaelic is a name for friend. And Tell us about Kara, what it means, and then the what C-A-R-A, and then show us an example of the word work that you do based on your beloved daughter's name. So Kara was named in the spirit of Anamkara which is friendship in, in Gaelic. And we're all soul friends. I hope you will take the letters in Kara's name and use them, use the qualities that I discovered in her name as a jumping off point to working with your own name or the name of someone you love and, and have lost. Um, there's so many ways we can be creative with the letters and qualities that we find in our names. And for everyone here, I named this time a time of kindness. The K in Kara is kindness. I named this time a time of kindness, a time of coming together, a time of deep and soulful introspection. And let us be kind to ourselves. As we journey from the K to the A in Kara, A is for alignment. If I'm not feeling aligned in this moment, let me name right now in the snap of a finger that the world is aligned. Even if I can't feel it, even if I can't see it, let me ask as if there is alignment. Let me move towards hope. Let me move to that which is aligned. Somehow the lights turn on, the stop signs go from green to red. There is an alignment in my inner world as there is the outer world. And to connect in with that alignment, to, to realize that alignment, I move into the R in Kara, regeneration. Let me com commit to the process of regeneration. I know that as I commit to regeneration, that regeneration is a possibility for everyone listening, that restoration is possible. It's just coming in, taking a few deep breaths. We do this at the beginning and the end of many 12-step meetings, just coming in coming back to the self, coming back to the heartbeat, coming back to the breath, and then taking that wisdom that I get in the rooms or I get in the quiet time of affirming, of feeling my own heartbeat, taking that, taking that knowledge that only comes from prayer and meditation, taking that knowledge into the world of action. A is for action. And this is my prayer for myself. I know it for myself as I know it for everyone. Who's listening tonight? Neil, back to you. What would your response be to what Lily just said? Well, it's an ongoing process. I mean, recovery is is an ongoing process. I talk about recovery enhancement. How do you make your recovery better today than it was yesterday? And, you Thank know, you. when we enter into recovery, we are given a toolbox. And inside the toolbox, there are many tools. And... It's up to us to avail ourselves of these tools. And we've talked about some of these tools uh, in, in this podcast, prayer, affirmation, not just doing it once or twice, but doing it repeatedly. And I want to ask Lily, what do you recommend in terms of affirmation? Hourly, daily, weekly? What works best in terms of staying in conscious contact with our consciousness. You know, the great teacher, Michael Beckwith, says that when someone asks you, hey, what are you about? You should be able to bring forth with affirmations about who you are in the world. I think sometimes, just like they say one minute at a time, <laughs> one day at a time goes to one minute at a time, would say that you, you use affirmations when you're doing typically mindless tasks and you make those mind less fast, mm. mindful. So affirmations while brushing, the, brushing my teeth. I take care of my body by treating it well. That might be an affirmation. 
using affirmations when I'm doing the dishes. So doing the dishes becomes a time of conscious contact. So it, it, standing in the checkout line and um, noticing my mind when it goes into judging or using times that I would, where I tend to feel impatient as times to reconnect with living an affirmative life, which is really connecting with God. You know, Ram Dass said that God is in the imagination. The imagination is in God. And that's a part of, you know, what you called, you know, uh, recovery enhancement. I wrote that down. I, I love that. I love that statement. So now a part of my affirmation will be like, this is a part of my re recovery enhancement right here, right now. So I take those statements that I hear in meetings um, or I hear on a show like that, and it becomes a part of my conscious contact, my affirmative life. I'm just so grateful to Tom for facilitating this connection so that we can come together and we can talk about what matters. Lily, on, on Chapter 17, you talk about yoga, transcendental meditation. You have a, a beautiful focus reflection on various and people and and groups that are helpful in enhancing our recovery like Neil talked about. So any of the other healing modalities that you have found helpful to you and that might be possibly helpful to some of the listeners? For me, finding a moving and breathing practice that is right for me has been essential. I, you know, it doesn't matter if it's Tai Chi, yoga, some sort of moving and breathing practice. And for me, that's essential because like many in recovery, I, in order to slow down, starting with meditation right out of the gate, um, many of us aren't ready for that. So like moving calms the body. It, it centers the body. And when we move the body, it's acting, right? We're acting ourselves into that right thinking. So after we've moved the body, often meditation just comes with a gift. There's there's no efforting. Have you ever had that moment where you've ridden an exercise bike or walked the dog and suddenly you find that moment of stillness? And And that stillness comes out of that connection with our own humanity, our own biology, our own physiology, if you will. Trusting, you know, trusting our heartbeat and breath, or, or, for me. Beautiful. Uh, Lily, I was, I was going to ask you to share some of the blessings of Kayla's death. Uh, she's been gone now since 2009. Where is your heart now today? You know, um, my heart is in a good place today. I like to say that life can suck, but I can't let it suck me under. You know, for a long, long time, I went through what many call that dark night of the soul, yeah. where I really, you know, I was angry with with God, but I did my breathing. I was angry with my own breath. You know, I didn't want to breathe. I didn't want to live, but I did it anyway. And that's, and that's the crucial piece. You know, the crucial piece is sticking with it. The, the contrary action, without the contrary action, all of the recovery enhancements in the world doesn't mean a thing. Without, without acting the opposite, we can't get to that. I can't, for me, I can't get to that place of peace if I'm not willing to do the work even when I don't want to and even when it feels awful. And that means sitting in the rooms where I might be having a problem with the person sitting across from me, like not giving up my seat, no matter what. There's so many no matter what, right? <laughs> yeah, lovely. Lily, you came to adopt two beautiful children, which you know your family, and Using the word adoption, there's a lovely, lovely connection between your beloved daughter and your two, your two, your two, your, your, your two daughters that you have now. I think it kind of captures maybe what Neil was also 
uh, inquiring about. Could you read from the bottom of 138 and the top of 139? I invite anyone who is maybe looking to adopt to take these qualities and make them their, their own. I once heard someone say that adoption described a family that was bound together not by blood, but by love. I liked these sentiments, so I did the name work for the word adoption to see how it felt. A is for allow. I allow goodness to flow into my life. D is for divine. My family is divinely appointed. O is for optimism. I look with optimism toward the future while embracing the now moment. P is for parenthood. I honor my chosen expression of motherhood, and I parent from a conscious and loving place. T is for truth. I honor my family's individual and collective truth. I is for intimate. I create an intimate, loving home. O is for open. I am open and I listen to my children's needs. N is for North Star. The love of family is my North Star. Lily, you, you say that family is your North Star. Could you talk a little bit about your husband, David, and he being by your side throughout all of this? David is that, you know, as Winnicott said, David in many ways is that good enough parent to inform me. I'm blessed to have a loving husband who has supported me in, in, in all facets of life. And he's an amazing father, an amazing father. And, you know, of course, his, his grief, no, we're like snowflakes, you know. Our thumbprints are all different. And his grieving process is personal to him. And it, it looks very different. It looks very different. And I am so grateful for his acceptance of my process. And I only hope I can be as accepting of his process. And Lily, if you could say one thing to Kara right here, right now, what would it be? Thank you, Kara. Thank you for my life. Because Kara has really given me my life. Without Kara, I may have gone back to drinking. I certainly wouldn't be the kind of mother that I am today. I don't know that I, she is my angel. Kara, you are my angel. You are my angel. She guides me. I don't know that I would have held on. I may have had Kara and gone back out there. I was still holding on to old people, places, and things. And I don't know. I don't know. So she is my miracle. I am just beginning to connect with her in that sort of real, palpable way. You know, of course, I'd do anything to have her back in my arms. Mm. But my process is taking hard steps, taking all the, the pain, the suffering, and and transforming it. And I know that's not popular in some grief circles, but I don't. I can't think of another way. I can't think of another way. You know, Victor Frankl talks about the Holocaust survivor and great therapist talks about creating meaning. There were people in the death, the Nazi death camp who mm -hmm. became ugly and bitter and brittle. And there were people who would grow flowers and play cards and move towards life. I have to make it have positive meaning because the alternative to me is the atrophy and, and death, you know, not to be dramatic. Lily, in the conclusion to your book, you have the most beautiful reflection on the pandemic and on the collective tragedy and grief as humankind were experiencing it. You do a beautiful reflection using the, the word name work on the pandemic. Would you share with us, I found this so uplifting, so challenging, so healing at the same time, you know, it brought me square with my own sense of loss and grief in the, in the course of this pandemic. This is my affirmation for all of us right now. Here, here are my thoughts. P is for powerlessness. I accept that I am powerless over this pandemic, and I do what I can to stay safe, healthy, and maintain a positive state of mind. A is for acting as if. 
When darkness sets in, I act as if everything will be all right. I am a light for myself and others. N is for noble. I look to what is good and right in the world. My path is noble, courageous, and true. D is for direction. I surrender to not knowing and find inner direction through becoming still. Out of the stillness, I am more readily able to align with positive change makers and work towards creating a just society. E is for ember. I stoke my inner fire with the divine embers of positive thought, deed, and action. M is for miracle. I look for the miracles in daily life. I is for intelligence. I trust my innate intelligence and perception. I trust myself when something doesn't feel right. C is for center. I take time each day to go within and find my still center, whether I am on the front lines or distancing at home. I want to re-echo D for direction. I surrender not knowing and find inner direction to becoming still. Out of this stillness, I am already able to align with positive change makers and work towards creating a just society. Back to you, Neil. Well, the book is called Giving Grief Meaning. It's a method for transforming deep suffering into healing and positive change. And you can certainly find the book uh, at Amazon and other online retailers, or maybe at your favorite independent bookstore as well. And to find out a little bit more about uh, Lily and the work that she is doing with the Name Work Project. That website is thenamework.com. Lily's website is lilydoolan, D U L A N.com. Lily, I want to thank you for your time, for your insight, and, and the, the beautiful thoughts that you have shared in print and now here on the podcast with Tom and I. And Tom, I want to thank you as well for putting us all in touch. Thank you. Thank you, Neil. I'm Neil Scott, the program Recovery Coast to Coast. Well, I certainly hope that you have enjoyed this important discussion on grief. We all deal with grief at some point in time. And again, for me, grief is love with no place to go. It's the price, basically, that we pay for love. And by the way, 100% of the proceeds from Lily Doolin's book, Giving Grief Meaning, support the work of the Kara Love Project, the foundation that was created in Kara's loving memory. We'll continue with Recovery Coast to Coast with some final thoughts about prayer from actress Julie Harris. We'll do that in just 30 seconds. We wasted a lot of years hoping, praying for things to get better. I was desperate to save our family. That's when I made the contact. She contacted Sundown M Ranch. Sundown's nationally recognized alcohol and drug treatment program teaches family members how to break down the barriers of denial. They are taught the skills needed to deal with addiction as a family. Now we're making up for lost time. It was the best contact I ever made. Go to www.sundown.org to learn more. And now, as promised, here is actress Julie Harris with some interesting thoughts on the power of prayer. Prayer is not overcoming God's reluctance. It is laying hold of his highest willingness. Richard C. Trench. The concept of a stern and reluctant God is rooted deeply in some of us. Perhaps it has been difficult to let go of the idea that God is judgmental and punishing. We may have felt that God has not forgiven us, or because we have not yet forgiven ourselves, we may feel undeserving of his love even now. Through our own direct experience, we have come to believe that God is loving and caring. It is our firm conviction that he wants us to be happy, joyous, and free. How do we know this? When we turn to God in a state of surrender and humbly ask for his help, our prayers were answered. We were granted freedom from our pain and obsessions and were given courage and strength to deal with our gravest problems. We were led from despair to hope and shown a way by which our lives and the lives of others could become immeasurably brighter. Today, we absolutely insist on enjoying our relationship with God. 
for we know with certainty that he is and always will be a positive force in our lives. We pray not to overcome the harsh judgment of a reluctant God, but to join forces with a kind and loving Father. Thought for today, God is all forgiving, even if you have yet to forgive yourself. Well, that wraps up this edition of the National Podcast Recovery Coast to Coast. If you've enjoyed the podcast, we would love to hear from you. Our email address is recoverycoasttocoast at comcast.net. Our website, recoverycoasttocoast.org. And please hit the subscribe or follow button because it's free and you'll be notified the next time we publish a podcast. You can also write a review of our ongoing podcast. Let us know what you like and what you don't like. Join us next time for America's Voice for Recovery, Recovery Coast to Coast, the national podcast. And remember, if you know someone who's experiencing problems with alcohol or any other drug, here's a 24-hour national helpline that offers free information and confidential treatment referrals. Spanish-speaking individuals available as well. It's pretty easy to remember. 1-800-622-HELP. And another shout out to our sponsoring organization, Sundown M Ranch, successfully treating individuals, including adolescents and their families, for well over 50 years. Sundown.org. I'm Neil Scott reminding you to stay healthy, live in gratitude, and be kind to others. Remember, the bright side of addiction is recovery. Pass it on.